everyone. Welcome to the Them Before Us podcast. This is your host, Jen Friesen. And today we have a special post-debate election cycle series episode featuring Katie Faust and Them Before Us Executive Director, Josh Wood. Thanks for being here, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Great to be with you. Obviously, lots to talk about after the big debate moment. So much to talk about. I'd love to start, though, with we did a little pre- pre-gathering, I wanted to call it like a tailgate of the debate where we got together with <laughs> Tiffany Justice of Moms for Liberty and Billboard Chris, who are two of our pro-child politics authors. So along with Katie and Josh, we did a webinar before the debate. Let's hear a little bit about what you loved about the webinar. These people know how to deliver great content. I mean, I love efficiency in writing and speaking and how I use my time and how I use my money. And I'll tell you what, you know, they both know exactly how to go right to the heart of an issue, to distill the points down to the bare bones. Um, and we got, you know, we packed in, it was a half hour webinar. We asked them about, you know, the truths, the lies about their respective chapters that they wrote for pro-child politics, what they're hoping to see in the debate, a quick analysis of, um, you know, who's getting things right in terms of putting them before us, the Democrats, the Republicans, what are we missing? So I just loved it because, you know, when you've got some people who are right on the front lines of fighting some of the biggest abuses of children, you know, she, the education system and the transgender machine, um, I think it was great to have both of them on to just kind of give us a heads up of what should we be listening for and looking for, you know, in the debate that happened right after we wrapped up. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't bought the book already, you should get it, Pro Child Politics. Uh, it's out, comes out September 24th. The The whole goal was we're heading into a really, you know, substantive debate. We're going to hear people talk about policies and ideas, and we want to make sure we prime people for, here are the things you need to be listening for. And here's the things, here's the ways to spot truth from lie. Because, you know, all politicians get very good at framing their issues in a very positive way. I'm so empathetic. I'm so compassionate. This is so good for you. This is so helpful. And we wanted to help, you know, discern for help people discern what's going to be helpful for them and, and what's going to be pro child and what's really pro adult dressed in children's clothing. And uh, well, as we all know, we went into a debate that I would say the real loser of that debate was substance. This we did not get uh, a substantive look at any of these issues, in my opinion. That was somewhat moderators. Some of this was candidates. But man. We did not have the debate that we deserved. Mm -hmm. You know, a bunch of people on X or social media would say, once again, I would like to ask out of 33 or what, 330 million people in the United States, is this really the best two people we could come up with? Because I, kind of to your to the point of the webinar, we were talking about, you know, this is the substance we want to see. Do, did most of us think there was going to be a lot of substance coming out of here just based on what we know of the two candidates already? I think I'll... Most yeah, people talked about who lost the debate. Was it Kamala Trump or the American people? And, you know, so <laughs> we have notes that we're going to go through uh, just talking about some of those big highlights. But were there maybe maybe I'll challenge you to think of was there a standout positive thing you think you saw from the debate? And then maybe was what was the standout terrible thing you saw? I don't know if there was anything positive, to be honest. You know, our work group chat was just kind of exploding all last night about, oh my gosh, what a missed opportunity. Oh, I can't believe that she said that. He said that. Why did, why did they fact check him, but they didn't fact check her? I mean, to me, that was, you know, if there was a story, because I mean, let's be honest, I think Kamala Harris cleared the bar. I think the bar was fairly low, but she cleared it. Um, Trump came in and he trumped. Uh, and unfortunately, um, I think that it was the deck was stacked against him in terms of the moderators very obviously had supposedly fact checked him several times, did not fact check the very obvious, clearly debunked lies that Kamala, you know, threw his way. And she had spent a lot of time preparing for this. And she she really was able to deliver a lot of, you know, zingers, one liners. Um, but what she did the most successfully was she baited him and he took it. So unfortunately, he spent some of the time where he could have been addressing substance, where he could have been pointing out the fact that if she really wanted to do all of these different you know, goals, aims, new policy, why didn't she do it already? So unfortunately, it was a really missed opportunity for Trump. I think she came out looking better. Um, but I think you're right. The American people lost. And I do hope that everybody turns off ABC in the future 
They have absolutely revealed themselves to be complete partisan hacks because there was nothing neutral about the way they moderated that debate. I'm hoping that the positive out of this is that we finally hit our rock bottom. You know, I do think uh, I'd liken it to those, you know, someone with an addiction or you, there's like these certain turning points in your life where you kind of look at yourself and you go, I'm not doing this anymore. And I really hope that whether it was the legacy media, because I think there is a, a, an element of that where we go, are we are we joking like this? That felt so one sided or with both parties. We're not going to talk about anything. We're going to completely deflect on every single issue. We're going to talk about things that the American people don't care about. You know, right, right prices that are rising, immigration. Uh, you go down the list, just not dealt with in a substantive way. I, I, the, the, there's a positive. I'm hoping that people finally go, this is not the best we can do. And we have got to turn a page here. And what was the, like a bad standout moment for you, Josh, if there was just one? We'll go into a bunch of things, but. Man, the thing that really frustrated me was the fact checks on abortion specifically. They, they you, you take this in, it, as a whole. There was a couple of different things that were said. Uh, number one, that late-term abortions just don't happen, period. Then that states, there's no states with uh, late-term abortion, even that's legal, that people and that people aren't executed after birth. Well, that's just all categorically false. Late-term abortions absolutely happen. Students for Life posted something today where a woman called into a, a clinic. You can find this on their Twitter. She called into a clinic, said, I'm 34 weeks pregnant. What do I do? They said, we do this all the time. It's not a big deal. Here's what happens. And they described a process where they inject a solution into the fetal heartbeat. That's what they said, the fetal heart, not a baby. And then they, rem they induce you and they remove the products of conception. The and it was just all this dehumanizing language. And she said, are you sure I can do this? And she goes, this is way safer than pregnancy. This is way safer than pregnancy. Then she said, it happens all the time. We do this all the time. She goes, so I'm not rare. Yes, happens all the time. Well, you could just do 10 seconds of Googling to find nine states have no limits whatsoever. Now, again, there are also plenty of documented cases from the CDC of babies surviving an abortion, coming out alive, and Governor Waltz, who is on her ticket, specifically changed language in Minnesota from re in 1976 law that required doctors to intervene to save the life of a child born post-abortion. He changed it to not preserve, care, care. You have to care for the child. Now that again, we, the, this is sheep's, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing, comfort care for the child has resulted in since then the death of children because no longer and they had someone testify on this who was a, an ambulance driver and he said uh, i delivered a child at 31 weeks and i had to provide uh, everything i could to preserve the life of the child and if i had done what they're calling care which is to leave the baby on a table and cover them up and let them expire by themselves he goes i would have gone to jail but we call it care in one context it's 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 absurd. And he did this on purpose. Late term abortions do happen. Post birth abortions do happen. I'm not saying they're a majority and we don't need to be fantastical and say it's it's a majority. And it happens all the time. We're just not we just shouldn't lie to people. If you want to accept abortion and you want to be pro abortion, fine. But I can't let you do it with this propaganda. You need to look full in the face at the horror that is being perpetrated and you need to accept all of it because this is absolutely a part of it and these late-term abortions aren't even happening just uh just for fetal abnormalities or life of the mother mm -hmm. the Guttmacher institute said they happen consistent with uh early term abortion the reasoning behind early term abortions as well so this is not uh an exception people get when given the opportunity people will get these for all kinds of reasons that was my my low moment because I felt like that was such an unfair fact check, and I was really disappointed that Trump did not point out that he was right when he called this an absolutely radical position pushed by the left. Yeah, yeah. that's. I think that that is um, that could be the story of the debate. That you know we be we each sort of um, 
have our own set of facts. And I would say that, you know, a lot of what Kamala was promoting, um, you know, a lot of the stats that she cites, some of them have been massaged into existence or out of existence. I mean, things like, oh, crime is going down. Well, that's because you guys are changing the way crime is reporting or not reporting crime at all. And it was the same thing with, oh, well, these late term abortions, right? They don't take place or these post birth, you know, exposures of infants that never happens. Well, Tim Walls, her running mate, actually gutted the Born Alive Protection Act and changed the way reportings are done. So even if they are happening, we don't know about it. So of course you can say, well, this never happens because you're not reporting it because you're not required to report it. So unfortunately we are in a situation where um, we do have to be very critical of even official sources in terms of what is coming out of, um, you know, legacy media, especially. Um, and it is time, I think, for alternative media sources to rise up. And for those that do, you know, may we be very careful with the facts. May we be very careful to report things accurately. Um, because I'll tell you what, you know, you get to, um, you're really going to control the fate of not just the nation, but children, if we don't have an accurate handle on exactly what kind of atrocities are taking place. Yeah, you know, Lila Rose talks about there is no, it, because life of the mother is used a lot, especially when it comes to third trimester abortion. With technology right now, with babies being able to su survive, I just saw a Charlie Kirk quote where he gave us very specific where the baby survived at 20 weeks, but let's say it's 25 or whatever. Let's say, uh, you know, you come in and it's 25 weeks and you have a medical issue. The baby can be delivered alive and has a really good chance of surviving now. Lila Rose talked about why would you need to kill the baby first, then remove the products of conception when you could deliver the baby alive? A yeah, well, the baby whatever. Will be delivered. The bottom line is, yep. no baby. You will deliver a baby. Will it be alive or will it be dead? Right. Um, and this idea that taking the baby out piece by piece is healthier. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. It's it's definitely not. So I just I think that was my frustration watching this. And we can go. Let's maybe just talk specifically about abortion. What Trump said about abortion and call. I just am so frustrated. We don't have a really principled person on the conservative side that would say. This is the ending of the life of an innocent human being in the womb, not couching it in. It's a fetus. Is it viable? Is it whatever? And this idea of like, I'm going to hedge on, well, I wouldn't say national abortion ban is bad and blah, blah, on and on and on. I put it to the States. It's great to, in a more libertarian way to say, you know, it's in the hands of the States. It's in the hands of the voter, the votes of the people. Okay, great. But I want someone to say, I think baby murder is bad. I'm the party. I'm with the party that thinks it's worse than you guys do. It, it, it even just something like that, a little bit of a distinction. And we, I was chatting to someone on our board, them for us board the other day. And he was just saying, that's what people on the more conservative side need to start doing. Baby murder, bad. Killing babies is bad. And just stop using all this special, careful, like you said, massage language around it. So yeah, what were, what were your thoughts about how Trump in particular He's representing the more conservative side, quote unquote, talked about uh, abortion in the debate. Parties exist to win elections. Like we have to remember that. Then that's what's frustrating for people that are trying to infuse their principles into politics is that the vehicles we have available primarily exist to win elections, not to advocate for our principles. And that's extremely frustrating because we do. Uh, I understand exactly why uh, Trump was uh, in the position to say we want to veto a federal abortion ban and why he's taking the position of we need to kick this back to the states. It, but in my opinion, taking it back to the states, this this is a human rights issue. Look, we have to take our principles to their logical conclusion. If we believe it is a life at conception, then that is an American citizen that deserves protection, period. And I don't care if location shouldn't determine their, their, the right to life, whether they're in California or Georgia, that, that is a child. It deserves protection. And it is the concern of every human being that lives in the United States to protect that child. It's, it's reminiscent of me of sending, we're going to say, we're going to send the slavery issue back to the States. I mean, that was a state's rights issue. And no one took that argument because we said, no, you don't get to own somebody, period. We fought a war over it. And I, I don't see how this issue on abortion should be delegated to a state level decision. And it, it does break my heart that 
we are having these votes at the state level, and we're seeing in some places uh, these restrictions uh, were becoming more pro-abortion in our states. That's, that says a lot about, I think, the soul of America. And that, that, that for me is, is just disheartening. Yeah, I agree with you that there's definitely some political calculations being made, obviously, in the way that Trump thinks, talks, speaks about this. Um, and it is, um, you know, he's going to do what he wants or thinks that he needs to do to win. Uh, for us, that's not how we work. We being Christians, we being people that believe in the rights and well-being of children. We don't make political calculations. We're not going to change our tune. We're not going to change our policy based on whether or not we think, oh, we can win or we can get some kind of advantage from speaking differently, adjusting our policy. No, we don't do that. We are defenders of children and we will sing the same tune, whether we're going to win or whether we're going to lose. Why? Because like you said, Josh, this is a human rights issue, like children's rights, their right to life, their right to their mother and father. They are human rights issues. And I understand that there are some people, even on the right, who think, well, you know, we're on, you know, we're so far along down the road of history, like we can let go of these sort of antiquated ideas about, you know, things like marriage and family or whatever. I learned something, you know, um, I think it was Chuck Colson that talked about how there's sort of a hierarchy of political issues. You know, obviously, all of the different things that we write about in pro-child politics from entitlements and um, taxes and national security and immigration and education and the environment and ESG and DEI and pornography and all of that. I mean, those are all really important issues that have a direct effect on the rights and well-being of children. But there's three issues that actually are the fount from which we are going to flow in terms of our decision making on all of these other political questions that are downstream. Those three issues are religious liberty, right? Conscience rights, the ability to think and speak and worship as we, you know, feel compelled to by the dictates of our conscience or our faith. Number two is life. What is life? When does it begin? Who gets to make it? Who gets to take it? Who gets to determine who lives or dies? What the definition of life is when it begins, right? And number three, family, marriage. Those three things are at the top of the hierarchy of political, they're not even political issues, right? They are fundamental human realities. And if you start to tinker with, play around with, or compromise on any of those three, inevitably you will get everything else wrong. Mm -hmm. So I understand that there are some candidates, you know, who are going to make some political calculations. Not so with you and not so with me. We do not get to adulterate, adjust, or accommodate to some new fangled form of, you know, political situation or convenience or, you know, some concept of modernity. No, these are fundamental human realities. And if we get religious liberty, life and marriage wrong, inevitably, we will start to get everything else wrong as well. I think to your point, that's why we're seeing I IVF be such uh, you know, weapon that's being used in this election because of what happened in Alabama and the court case there. And they're, it's like, oh no, they're getting too close to acknowledging that embryos, human embryos that are frozen are human beings. And, but to your point, this is not a winning issue for Republicans them hammering us with it and Republicans trying to separate distance themselves. And well, it's not really like abortion. And we've talked about, you know, Ted Cruz being asked, wait, I thought you believed life began at conception. And then he has to kind of, uh, 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 you know, hem and haw because he doesn't have, he didn't have a consistent answer ready to go from conception. What do we believe is true? And then how would it apply to IVF, to babies in the womb, et cetera. But this is going to be a big problem because I think I keep coming back to, we have not won the cultural debate on abortion, on IVF, on human rights issues uh, for human embryos and babies in the womb. So, you know, we're talking about the law, but the law feels quite downstream or at least parallel and culture is not there. So it seems like we're, we're going to keep hammering, butting heads on these topics. But, you know, as done before us, we're butting heads against so many of the folks on the conservative side. Well, I think until we, we often use nuance as a way to escape responsibility. And you're right in pointing out that the legal is often an easy way to legislate 
our morality when the truth is, guys, as believers here, the church has a big job to do that and it is out to lunch right now. I believe that we have to teach and instruct our people in it is it is complicated. I'm not saying it's not complicated, but it's it's also simple at the same time that these it, we have to follow the truth that life begins at conception and that will solve so many of these issues and that parents have to protect their children. And what what's frustrating for me is that if we fail to do this, we fail to disciple our people well in what the gospel teaches and, and how it informs the creation of family, um, all of these issues. We will continue to see what we're seeing, which is when given the opportunity, people will make these choices. They will vote in more pro-abortion policies. They will vote in, uh, you know, giving complete immunity to the baby creation industry. Like this is this and we if if that is true and people want that we are in trouble and that is there is some self reflection to do are we doing a good enough job exposing people cuz call me naive but i still believe that if presented with the truth people will be convicted they if we can do it and again that we got we got a lot of forces against us but i just want to believe that if we can properly present these issues to the american people to families making these very difficult decisions that they'll see the humanity in uh, the embryos, the fetuses, the, the babies, and they'll make different choices. You know, that certainly should be the case with Christian families and Christian adults, uh, because we are the ones that come from the worldview that mandates child protection, that understands the dignity of every human being, that has historically been known for child protection. And I'm just going to do a quick plug for our church curriculum here. We actually have served this up for you in a super digestible, low barrier format um, where you can go to our website right now, go to resources for churches, download our curriculum and just walk it through with some of your friends or introduce it to a small group in your church or show it to, to your pastor. I dare you just watch one or two of the videos and suddenly you're going to go, oh my gosh, this is exactly what our people need to know and understand because we go through everything from the perspective of child protection. We get to IVF and surrogacy and um, reproductive technologies, I think in video five, but we start out with fundamental child rights to, the, to life, to their mother and father, and why child protection has always been a hallmark of true Christianity. And you're right, Josh, like if the church itself is confused about this, how do we expect there to be clarity in the culture? First, we need to get this right. There really should be no confusion about this in the Christian community. Um, all of the principles are there, both biblically and in terms of natural law, for us to understand that these are matters primarily about child protection. And we all need to start understanding it, um, speaking about it that way, and really making political decisions along that vein as well. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. You know, we talked about the webinar with Tiffany and Chris, so they care about education and the transgender ideology, which are two things I'm pretty sure did not come up at all in the debate last night. So why do you think the transgender ideology did not, even Trump didn't, I don't know if he would have had an opportunity to inject that in or if he was told to do that and just miss the boat, but there was no questions asked about transgender ideology. Why do you guys think that is? It only came up once and it was because the Kamala Harris campaign had recently put out a statement or um, made a policy clear that they would provide state funded gender reassignment surgery to illegal immigrants. I mean, it's, it is so wildly I mean, immigration, the American people are not with her. Gender ideology, the American people are not with her. State-funded sex, quote-unquote, reassignment surgery, they are not with her. The CNN, I mean, the CNN lady was surprised. She was like, wait, what? She actually said that? Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, of course, nobody dug into that. That was kind of another... Um, you know, I would say hallmark of the debate. Trump really did get some difficult questions and she got an awful lot of softballs that were literally like the answer was framed in the question that she was handed. So yeah, there was, it's too bad because she is so like rabidly radical and it's emblematic in this whole, like we are going to fund the transgender surgeries of illegal immigrants coming to the United States. I mean, it was like a triple 
strike against her mm -hmm. in terms of three incredibly unpopular policies all folded into one. Um, and unfortunately, Trump did not take the opportunity to really drive that home because the truth is the American people on the whole are against child transitions. He could have really done a great job. And actually, he has been very clear about this in the GOP platform that he wrote and that he imposed upon the GOP. I've got major problems with how that happened. But on this topic, he actually is completely right. And the American people are with him. And it is too bad it didn't get more airtime at the debate. Well, let me clarify, Josh, think... before you jump in really quick. I'm fact checking myself. Look, I'm, I'm a, such a good moderator. So yeah, nobody was <laughs> asked about the transgender policies, but it came up twice from the candidates. Yeah. One with talking about Kamala Harris's crazy policies and the other with Trump bringing up Waltz and the bill about basically letting you kidnap the government, kidnap your kids if you refuse to do the gender confirmation, whatever it should be. Go ahead, Josh. Both winning issues. I mean, talk about something that's both right and politically wise. Too bad he didn't spend more time on it. Yeah, I think my only ad would be we have got to begin framing this issue as how it affects the child and tell the story. Tell the story of a child that ran away from their parents to get surgery, found refuge in Minnesota under the law, and even to the point where they will not notify anyone that this child has come. These, this is not unique to Minnesota. There are other states with this law. And ask these parents to put yourself in these shoes, that your child, influenced by a public school teacher or a, or a friend or, or the culture, is, is, is taken down this path, aided by malevolent adults who've known your kid for two weeks and they run away, they receive life altering care. Whether or not you agree with it, you must agree that it is life altering, scare quotes, care. And then to think that your parental rights will be voided, you will not know where your child is, they'll be taken into custody of the state to go undergo these procedures. I just, again, call me naive. I think properly presented there are so few people in the United States that will agree that that is the type of country we are and want to be. Ask this final uh, question and then we'll I'll wrap it up. But uh, Kamal Harris brings up a story that sort of is connected to what we talked about at them before. As she talks about a friend and her the friend's stepdad. Can you will you finish up with that, Katie? Well, she was sharing the story about um, kind of being traumatized by a friend of hers in high school, I believe, and she just kind of casually mentions that um, this girl was abused by her stepfather, sexually abused by her stepfather, I believe. And anybody that is a follower of them before us goes, mm, not surprised. Not because all stepfathers are wicked. Of course they are not. Thank God for the heroic stepfathers that step in to fill the gap of a negligent biological dad in the life of a child. But everybody here who's read our book, who's watched our church curriculum, you know, Everyone who's listening to the podcast understands that an unrelated man sharing living spaces with a child is the most dangerous person in the child's life. And that when you look at rates of abuse and neglect, whether it is emotional, mental, physical, sexual, those rates skyrocket when he joins the household. So, you know, what she mentioned in passing, I think all of the them before us followers go, mm, yep, not surprised. Yeah, well, thank you both so much for your insights into the debate. We could talk forever about this, I'm sure. But uh, for all of you listening, yeah, we, I hope you go to themforest.com, check out our resources, check out our articles and stories, and uh, consider sharing them with the people in your life to help them get informed, like to Josh's point, so then we can make better decisions politically and, uh, yeah, hold people to account. Let me also say, um, we could really use your financial support. You know, we have had massive opportunities this year, I mean, from the book um, to, you know, the documentary that's in process with Focus on the Family to the launch of our church curriculum, which people, nobody else is, nobody else is doing this. Nobody else is doing this for the culture at large or churches in particular. And these are the issues that people need to understand why, so they can properly understand what is being said and what's not being said, things like a presidential debate. Um, you know, the, the webinar that we put together with with Tiffany Justice and Billboard Chris. I mean, these guys are absolute leaders in the field, their respective field. I mean, they're, it's very hard to find bigger voices on the two topics that they authored you know, within our book. We are doing things that no other organization is doing, and we need your financial partnership. Right now, we are limited 
sorry, sorry. I'm just, this is turning into a pitch, but right now the only thing that limits us is resources. We have unlimited invitations and people begging us to help us shape, you know, their legislation, respond to different questions they're getting to influence the influencers. And this global movement, it is going global. And right now we've got, I'll say this because I am, you know, the boss, but we have five employees doing the work of 10 employees and we really need 20 employees. That is what we need. So we would love for you to partner with us. Um, get over here. Like when I say I will change the world with your money, I'm going to change the world with your money. Like anything that you can give to us, one-time gift, monthly gift, um, we will take it. Please seriously, prayerfully consider it because um, we are at the place where the global takeover, it needs to ramp up because the kids are being victimized in every way they can be victimized. And we at Them Before Us are one of the few places that are confronting a lot of these global threats. Thanks for sharing. We love it. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks for joining the movement.